Robin Hood Radio and the Robin Hood Radio Network is proud to present Leonard Lopate at Large, lively hour-long in-depth discussions providing overviews and context to topics usually covered in partial measures. His guests include leading thinkers, scientists, artists, economists, farmers, historians, authors, and politicians. Mr. Lopate is a Peabody Award winner whose numerous honors include three Associated Press Awards and three James Beard Awards. Lisa Brennan Jobs should have had an ideal childhood. Her mother, Chris Ann Brennan, is a free-spirited painter and writer, and her father was Steve Jobs. But Chris Ann Brennan struggled to make a living from her art, and Steve Jobs denied paternity until he was forced to after having been sued by the state. By the time she was seven, Lisa had moved 13 times. Fortunately for her, she seems to have inherited the creative talent of one of her parents and the drive, logic, and vision of the other. Her memoir, which she has called Small Fry, is published by Grove Press, and I'm very pleased that it brings Lisa Brennan Jobs to our show now. Hi. Hi. Thank you. And uh, I'm wondering where the title comes from, Small Fry. It's a part of the book. It's a nickname that my father used to call me. I mean, it's a term of endearment. Mm -hmm. Um, And then also it means it has a meaning that is insignificant, um, sort of the fish that you throw back into the sea <laughs> to give them time to grow. And another thing I liked about it is that it's in Shakespeare, so fry is a very old word. And I thought, well, good. It can be translated into many languages. You have two epigraphs, and one is Hopefully. from Shakespeare, uh, from Pericles, about small fries being eaten by bigger fish. Yeah. That's what you're talking about. And, uh, and in, is Pericles by Shakespeare? Some people say it's not. But hopefully. Was uh, your dad the kind of whale who devoured everything? <laughs> um, it's been interesting coming out with this book because I have been trying to do this maybe foolish task of publishing and benefiting from his notoriety while also wanting people to understand so they won't be under the misapprehension this is a book about him or the mis guided notion that this is a book about him um, trying to say this is a coming of age story about a girl um, and it's really hard to get that out somehow but of course then I'm benefiting the, all the while so it's been a strange time so yes in some ways I can say that the, that the, the headlines of all the articles have been devoured by him hmm. well considering uh, the life that you've led it's okay if you uh, take advantage of the the name Jobs, I think. The other uh, epigraph is uh, from Saul Bellow. Can you paraphrase it? Mm. I love that one. I love that book. Um, He says something like he's standing in the... He's watching something about him. He's the center of... What is it? He's the subject of the the flurry, but he's watching it from a distance. Mm-hmm. And how does that relate to your life? I felt as if sometimes I was watching the out, watching the outlines of my life being described by others. I would sometimes be in an airport going from somewhere to somewhere else, and I would see all the covers of the magazines had my father's face on them. And I wasn't really able to get a hold of him at that time, or he wasn't calling me back, or he wasn't... Um, you know, I, I wasn't invited on vacation or so it felt strange to be in that airport at that Hudson newsstand mm-hmm. looking at those magazines and thinking, that's my father <laughs> and no one knows it. How strange. Steve's widow, Lorene Powell Jobs, uh, their three children and his sister, the writer Mona Simpson, issued a statement to The New York Times that said your book, quote, differs dramatically from their memories of those times. And you've said that you're worried readers will only focus on the bad. Should we address those things before we continue? Uh, we can. I I did think it's a strange thing to write a memoir because you are, in order to write about your own life, you necessarily have to write about the lives of others. And you're sort of casting this net um, And you're writing as truthfully as you can. You're trying to capture emotional truth. Um, You're trying to capture people as you saw them. 
But having had the experience since I was very young of being written about, I guess there was that Time Magazine article when I was three, um, which obviously I was too young to know about. But then there have been books and articles and movies, uh, most of which I haven't seen or participated in, but still they've been around. And so I know, and I know from personal experience, how it's such a strange feeling to see yourself in someone else's perception and their print. Um, and so, of course, I know it's difficult. But then when I wanted, when I felt like it, it was right and it was the right time for me to write this book, as much as I hesitated to write a memoir because I found it embarrassing, I I decided that I did have the right to write my own story, even if it pulled others in, it to, in its net. And at one point in the book, you say your dad asked you if you would ever write about him, and you said no. Well, so and my justification... He must have been concerned about what you might have said. <laughs> he, he might have been. Um, although, it's interesting with this book, there's, as far as I understand, and again, I don't really watch or read other information about my father, and I'm the last person to tell you about his business life or tell anybody. I don't know about it. Um but I do feel that although the dramatic and possibly awful moments between us or, and between him and others that I, that I knew about and wrote about are more visceral, people have told me, than other accounts, they match up with them in certain ways. And then in this book, I imagine there are more tender and delightful moments than are in other books, too. And I feel like in the actual book, not in the excerpts of the book or in the paraphrasings of the book. Because people pick out the juiciest parts. Right, of course, yeah. But the juicy positive parts are plentiful and they're kept in balance, I felt, with the drama. Um, so so perhaps uh, it wasn't so terrible as some people might think reading the excerpts. What about, uh, for you, was it painful to revisit some of these incidents or feelings? And do you have a different perspective on any of them um, because you've written about them? I have a very different perspective on many of them because I wrote about them. There was a lot of, um, there was a lot of self-pity in my writing about my own adolescence that a friend sort of cornered me and said, a friend I'd known my whole life said it sort of read some of that section and said, Lisa, you know, I've known you my whole life. And in this section, you seem so powerless and you kind of always got what you want and I'm not buying it. So I went and rewrote that section. It kind of broke it open for me because then, and I was also disappearing on the pages at first. So people would say, the story's pretty good, but where are you? Where did you go? So some of the, Finding my own part in the story, which in some ways I guess is finding one's own or my own deviousness, my own um, senses of entitlement, my own scrappy ways of getting what I want was a way to find my character in the pages too. And then I guess, although this may sound cheesy, it is as true as anything I can say, finding my own deviousness on the pages and my own scrappiness and my own character meant I found it in my life more. How long have you been working on it? Uh, you changed publishers at one point. I've been working on it for a while. I um, I say seven years, uh, but it's probably been longer. And, and you've been writing other things at the same time. Not really. Not mm -hmm. for the past seven years. Mm -hmm. um, I I was working with um, I was working with um, Penguin Press mm -hmm. with Anne Godoff, and they were actually great. And they sort of stuck with me for many years and were very patient and were intent as I was on this being a literary memoir, which meant it took time needed to be marketed differently. But I think I just, I sort of dragged it on a really long time. And toward the end, it felt like I still wasn't ready and, and, and perhaps the clock had run out. And you've said So that I changed to a very, very uh, literary um, and, and independent publisher Grove and that's been a wonderful experience and nourishing and incredible. You've said that you're happy that you hadn't written the book in your 20s but it, it might have been a very different book um, uh, so you've changed over the years 
Well, that's it's, it's all these points that are moving at the same time, right? There's there's the the writer who's aging and gaining perspective as they're writing, and then I'm writing about a girl who's aging and gaining perspective as she's growing up, and I'm writing about parents. Who are, so everyone, all the points are moving. Um, I did grow up over the years, yes. Um, and, th- and then you became a parent yourself. Did that play a role in uh, your, and did that help you to understand this story better? I'm sure it will help me to understand the story better. And I think part of the reason I said I didn't want to have written the book in my 20s is there's a kind of edginess of my 20s that's really intense that where I might have written a more edgy, violent book. Um, and then in my 30s, it's gentler. And then, or m- perhaps more balanced. Mm-hmm. And then I imagine if I'd written in my 40s, it would have been kind of melting, you mm-hmm. know, melting with sleep deprivation and compassion and empathy. <laughs> Um, and so that it wouldn't have had enough edge um, to be the book that I want it to be now. Now, despite his very public persona, would you say that your father was a, a private person? Um, I don't know. Mm. I don't know if I can answer that. Was he a private person? Well, you chose I think he not- had a lot of dear friends. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's interesting with him saying with the anecdote you brought up earlier in the book with him saying, you're not going to write about me, are you? Um, I think he sort of understood I was a writer. And my justification for myself at the time was, I might write about myself, and surely I'm allowed to do that. I didn't write this book about him, you know, as a kind of, but also that reading Philip Roth's Patrimony, I thought, oh, I had that moment. I had that moment. Um... So I thought if I had it, I should should use it. And and also that moment was a part of my own, to whatever degree it was devious or, or wrong, it was a part of opening up my character to you and having you understand me. You chose not to cooperate with Walter Isaacson when he was writing a, bi- writing a biography of your father. So uh, why did you decide not to do that? I never talked with Walter for a variety of reasons. And um, what did you think of his book? I didn't read his book. <laughs> Um, I heard it wasn't fact checked. Uh, fact checking takes. I did it. I fact checked my book, um, and my book had many, many fewer facts that needed checking. I imagine. Um, so fact checking can take, and 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 yet even so, it took months. I think, or at least more than a month, to fact check this. So, I imagine that would have taken a very long time, and I think he, his publication deadline might not have allowed for it. Although I don't know. So the reason I didn't talk with him, which was before that was because, one, I asked my father, do you want me to talk with him? My father said, you can do what you want. Um, And so I I decided I didn't want to. And two, I just, if you can imagine the position it puts me in, not knowing his final result, not knowing his emphasis, um, not knowing whether it is in some ways a way to get at my mother from my father, (laughs) It, I thought it would give him some authority to talk about my family if I talked about, if I talked with him and I didn't trust or know the way that he was planning to talk about my family. I'm speaking with Lisa Brennan Jobs on Leonard Lopez at Large today on WBAI New York 99.5 FM. Her memoir, Small Fry, has gotten a lot of attention, obviously, because uh, her father was Steve Jobs, but also because it tells a really interesting story. So let's tell a little bit about that story. Uh, when did your parents first meet? They in, in high school, eh? They met in high school. And uh, they had an on-and-off relationship for a number of years after that. Uh, how how long were they together? Oh, God, I don't know. Um, they were together in high school, I think, for maybe two years, and then this could be wrong. I'm not exactly sure. And then they actually lived together in this house with goats, um, he would carry her to the door or they would make a dash for the door so they didn't get bucked. <laughs> um, that was over one summer before he went to college. He'd skipped a grade, so he was older. He was younger, but he went to college sooner. Um, and then later, they both went to India independently, both came back and then got back together just at the sort of beginnings of Apple. Um, and I think things were kind of falling apart between them. And my mother had begun to plan her 
departure from the relationship. And that was when, ta-da, I was conceived. Mm -hmm. So uh, how old was she at the time? She was 23. They were both 23. And They were so young. What did your mother tell you about your father's reaction when she informed him that she was pregnant? It's funny. I hadn't known what his reaction was before this, but then... For this book, I had to talk to her. (laughs) Yeah. And um, it was quite dark. I think um, he certainly did not want a child. Apple was just beginning to take off. And I think he kind of snapped shut like a turtle, didn't say anything, and ran out the door and drove off. And after that, wouldn't talk to her about it. Hmm. Your mother was named after the flower chrysanthemum. I remember talking to her about that. Uh, did your father name you? But then he denied that. They named me together. He came to the farm where I was born. He missed my birth because I think she didn't realize it was going to be too s- that soon. But he was planning to come for my birth. But even as he came to this farm, I think he was walking around saying he wasn't the father. So it was odd. He had already, know, they, they were both involved with other people at that point? I don't know. I mean, I think there was someone he was set up with. Um, maybe even by the board of Apple or something. There was, And she wasn't with anyone then. I mean, she was just having me, I think. Mm-hmm. Just having had a child myself, I imagine she was quite occupied. Um, but, uh, yeah, one of the interesting things about writing this book for me was just going back and getting to spend time with my parents when they were younger than I am now, this time travel. Getting to spend time with my younger self and sort of feel her feelings and then but in a larger world with more perspective. And then to see my parents when they were younger, and it points to see see them in a different way from my older self. Did they tell you why they had a hard time staying together? I mean, I could understand that even myself from my own perspective now. They're both, um, their, their temperaments as they are now seem incredibly incompatible. Their value system seemed and seems quite similar to me in many ways. But temperamentally, um, my mother has a temper, uh, and my father and she don't, don't, I don't even, actually, I have trouble understanding how they were together for so long. Although I imagine it was uh, very profound. You're saying she had a temper, he was kind of cool. He was cool, but... And so cool that he'll stop talking for days when he's angry, and she's um, a hotter flame. You're talking about him as though he's still alive. I know. I was thinking, <laughs> should I do? I mean, I'm trying to talk about him also as a character in my book. So in that sense, he he continues, but no, he's he's gone. He 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 could be quite cold and uncommunicative, and uh, even he apologized to me when he was dying. He said, "I'm not very good at." communication uh and that seemed since to be he was a huge in communication yeah that's kind of odd it seemed to be a wonderful phrase to hear from him and a, an incredible understatement now he named his first computer lisa um most people assume that it, it was named after you but he denied that i'm not sure it was his first computer, and the only reason well, it was I'm the first that- one with a mouse. It was the first major breakthrough computer. Although, as I understand it, uh, it didn't survive partly because it was so incredibly expensive. Yeah, so it was a huge commercial failure. I think some of the technology was used in the Mac, I guess, and then also many years later in the next computer. And maybe we use some of it today. I'm not sure though, and I'm the last person again to talk about that. But I think um, he, he named it, he said he didn't name it after me. Um, And I'm not sure why he said that. I kept on asking him and I think it's an interesting point only because it was a point where the technological and the emotional intersected. Meaning for me, when I was younger, I didn't really particularly care about the computer What I cared about was that he hadn't been around and I'd been dreaming of him and hoping for a father and hoping for him. And if he'd named something after me, something so important to him during that time, it meant that he was hoping, hoping to be with me in some way 
or trying to get to me in some way while while I was trying to get to him. And so I was trying to get him to admit this, but he wouldn't say it. And I don't know why, in retrospect, he wouldn't say it. Maybe it's because he was ashamed of it, because it was such a failure. He was ashamed to attach it to me, or maybe less personally, he just did not want it to exist anymore, and so denied it. He was also denying his paternity. So, right. So that might have suggested that he was, he acknowledged that he was your father. It's a strange intersection of, of caring and lying and naming. You and your mother moved 13 times by the time you were seven. <laughs> Why? Your mother, your mother was an artist. Did she, could she make any money from her art? She didn't have much luck making money with her art. She didn't have a skill at marketing, I would say, was the main problem. Um, although art, even with a skill at marketing, can be patchy at best. But I think there were other problems, too. I think, I imagine if you don't have money, you can still find yourself a pretty stable situation sometimes. And she had trouble doing that. I think she was incredibly young and was so destabilized by the pregnancy itself. And after talking with her and her and discovering that she was actually not, not sure even after I was born that she was the right person to keep me because she didn't have a stable circumstance. So I think that there are, there were a variety of instabilities playing off of each other, you know, and, and so, so we started out on this farm and then where she had me and then she, I think she was thinking of staying there and getting a yurt or something. And then her sister, she called her sister with her plan and her sister said, no, you're not doing that. Come with, come live with us. So we lived with her sister for a while until it was time to leave there. And then, you know, some other house where we could be temporary for a while, where we could find another house. And I do understand sometimes you you know you've landed on a lily pad. You know you've landed on a temporary situation while you try to find a more permanent one. It just took us a long time to find a more permanent one. And I think even, I think she she's also perhaps not particularly good at finding permanent stability. Meanwhile, she was, um, you were on welfare some of the time and she was cleaning houses. Uh, right. did she, was she asking Steve for money? It's so funny. I'm saying she might not be good at it, but then when I look at her circumstances, they were so hard. You know, I just had a baby, and I was telling you earlier, I think, about how she had to walk to the laundromat to wash these mm -hmm. um, cloth diapers because we didn't have a car, and how different that is from my circumstance. You know, when Where we need a disposable this? diaper, we use a disposable diaper. Most of the time, we're trying to use cloth, but we have a service that cleans them for us. It's very different. Um, this was in California. So the sun was shining and it was beautiful. Um, just as a context, it was also beautiful. Um, but um, you were saying that it was, sorry. Well, I was, I was wondering about her art. Some of her projects, the, the ones you describe in the book, sound wonderful and, and kind of commercial. They were wonderful and it was frustrating to me as a kid that she couldn't manage to make them work because they sounded, and they still sound so eminently workable, but she wasn't able to do that. I think also probably the stress and the early stresses of, as you mentioned, being on welfare and going through all that she went through before my memory starts probably had a long shadow, too. When did your father start denying his paternity? Uh, and do you have any idea of why? He started, uh, as far as I know, as soon as he knew that my mother was going to have me. So when I was when she was pregnant with me and continued in an intermittent way. That was what was so interesting. Um, and possibly his intermittence about it was part of the reason that I wondered what was wrong with me that he wouldn't want to eagerly claim me. Um, and maybe that was also that question was an important reason for me to need to write the book. So he started out denying paternity, then the state sued him, and then he continued to deny it, citing another man whose dental records were, were subpoenaed, because that was how they did it before DNA tests. I don't know what they were looking for in teeth, but apparently it was conclusively not this other man who was my father. My mom would roll her eyes. I mean, of course he wasn't. <laughs> I knew who your father was. So then uh, they had to do a DNA test. They were new. I think it 
was 94 or 97% accuracy at the top, you know, that was the as high as the instruments could measure. We were related, so then he was required to pay um, child support. He paid it, but I think he continued to, as far as I found out from his ex-girlfriend, she said he would sometimes hold up this picture of me and say, you know, people are saying this is my kid. It's not my kid, but she doesn't have a father, so I'm trying to be there for her. So, now, But I- he continued until later as well. There are instances later where I would, missing him when I lived in England, when I was out of college, Googled him once and found out that on his work bio when he'd returned to Apple, he said he had three children, not four. And so I emailed him and said, hey, you know, and we weren't really in much contact, but it hurt me so much almost that it was that he was publicly saying it. Now, was what was his monetary situation at the time? Was was he strapped for cash? Because when Apple finally went public, he suddenly uh, was worth more than two hundred million dollars. I imagine he was strapped for time and strapped for sort of a sense of it emotionally of what he was going to do. Strapped for cash, as far as I understand, he was not. And I think this is interesting for people to understand. I think money is usually a conduit. Money is usually not about money. So yes, he had a lot of money, and we did not have any. I think when Apple went public, he he was suddenly worth, his stock was suddenly worth, I guess, $200 million. Yeah. And I was um, three or four. So that that wasn't the problem. But he still, he seemed to have issues of, over money. Um, uh, was he afraid that people were after him, interested in him for his money? I imagine people were sometimes interested in him for his money, and I think that probably was a fear. I think there was also something, it's funny because right now I feel like I'm, go- I'm going off the reservation. I'm I'm speaking p- possibly out of turn because I what I've done in this book is I've, not tried to tell you what everything means. I've. It's a little bit like on a trampoline when you stay really still so the other person can fly up. I'm putting things against each other and I'm including scenes and not including other scenes, of course, very carefully. But I'm not making sense of them necessarily for you. So I don't... I hesitate to try to make sense of this for you now. Um, but as a kid, you were trying to make sense of it all. You... I'm sure you couldn't understand why you saw your father so little. Um, he wasn't involved in your life for a long time. I didn't even understand you knew why that this, he was this f- successful man. I didn't understand why this super rich man wasn't lavishing me with money, mm-hmm. and uh, why I didn't have, you know, fancy fancy dresses and fancy shoes and a fancy bicycle and the right toys. I didn't understand that, and I felt badly about it. Um, you were a princess in disguise. Yeah, that's what. That's probably the way that I felt about myself. The Grimm's fairy tales probably hit home for me. Um, and I don't know why he couldn't do that, why he couldn't. I don't know if it would have been beneficial if he had. I guess one thing I'm kind of grateful for is that he didn't use his money to substitute for his affection. That can be troublesome. That can be diffi- That can be problematic, I think, for children. But at the time, I, I would have loved it if he just lavished me with money, even if he hadn't been around. Or gave of course, you choice like or, most kids. Uh, or you got you to a point where you could have a kitten. You, you had a problem adopting a kitten. We had a problem adopting a kitten because we'd moved so much. So when we went to the Humane Society, they asked us a few questions, and then they denied us a kitten. Mm-hmm. But later we had cats, and later we had mice. Um, not at the same time. <laughs> but um, I guess I also wanted to say... As far as I understand, there was something in the Buddhist, in the Zen Buddhist teachings that both of my parents followed that was about the dangers of material excess. And so I think, I think for most people, or for most people with, who have huge amounts of money, it's probably hard to hit the right point. Um, and so in my father's case, he might have hit under, but he didn't hit over. And so this is something I I went back and noticed. He wasn't willing to buy me off. And I think even as an adolescent, when I looked back at the way that I had been feeling at the time, I think I could have been 
and I was actually insisting upon being, and he refused to let me be bought. At the same time, it might have been nice to have not have to move all those times and ha- live on welfare and I think there's be able no to question. clean houses. There's no question that uh, it was a mistake in all the ways, that it was so hard in my early life. And I think it must have been hard. It's hard for me looking back at it. I think it's hard for my mother. And I think it probably was very hard for my father because it was so senseless. Were you told to keep your father's identity a secret? Uh, yeah, and one of my mother's boyfriends said I should get my fingers printed just in case I was kidnapped or something like that, which felt very glamorous to me at the time. <laughs> I might be kidnapped. I'm so important. Um, yeah, I was told not to tell, but of course I would tell about it all the time. I think as a kid you you talk about whatever you've got. I'm speaking with Lisa Brennan Jobs, her memoir, Small Fry is published by Grove Press. You're listening to London Lopate at Large with Lisa Brennan Jobs, who's written a memoir called Small Fry, published by Grove Press. Um, when did you, your father become re-involved in your life? What so was happening was about, in his life at that time? When I was about eight, he started coming over and taking me out for roller skates. And at first, it would be with my mother, too, because I, you know, would have been strange for me to go out with this man I didn't really know. And he was a little bit, well, he was very awkward. I imagine it must have been strange for him, as it was strange for me to get to know this kid. He was quite young. I was quite young. He hadn't hung around children much. Um, and he so, was kind of nerdy. I've, I've met Steve Wozniak. Yeah. And he's kind of nerdy as well, charming but nerdy. I, I can't imagine either of them feeling very comfortable uh, playing with kids. It's so funny. I don't think I've met Woz. So I can't comment on how similar or different he was from my father. My father was extremely charming and then extremely awkward. And sometimes there were um, just long silences. And the other thing is I think he didn't really know how to relate to me. And when I was looking back and writing about these sections as an adult, I thought, oh, right. It wasn't that he didn't want to talk to me. He just didn't know how. Of course, as a kid, you're thinking, oh, if I was more interesting or something, maybe he'd have something to say. Did you feel at all as if a, a dream was coming true that you finally had a father? Oh, my God. I felt like it felt like the most exuberant, incredible thing at some points, especially when we're driving. We're driving to go stay at his mansion overnight, just him and me. He's like this incredibly handsome, charismatic um, man who is famous, who's my father, and we're driving in his Porsche to his mansion. I mean, can you imagine? Although, the way you describe that mansion, it's a very strange house. It's true. Uh, it, it sounds kind of creepy. It didn't have much furniture. I, I think mean, here's this incredibly rich man. You would think that he'd have wonderful furnishings all over the place. Well, it was this summer house, I think, of a rich family, and it was, it was, he had bought it so that he could tear it down because it had these bu- huge, beautiful oak trees. Now, this was un- incomprehensible to me as a child, that you would have a mansion and you'd only have bought it for the trees. <laughs> but I see now, of course, the trees were incredible. And the house was, as he said, often shit. It, had, it was sort of built in this f- faux fancy, shabby um, style and... Or, It was in a fancy style in a shabby architecture, shabby build. (laughs) And so I think he's going to bought it thinking, oh, later I'll tear it down. I don't have time right now. Can you describe the room that you stayed in and why uh, he didn't always heat it for you? So that was a different house. Oh, that was a different house. Yeah. So the later he, he moved two and a half blocks or I think it was two and a half blocks from my, from my mother's house, from the house that my mother and I rented, that he rented for us. And and I was in high school and um, or going into high school. And it was actually quite a nice house, not a mansion. Beautiful house. But the downstairs didn't have heat. And for the downstairs to have heat, he would have had to sort of renovate it. And he just didn't want to do it. And But this is a point, this story is a point where I was able to go back as an adult and sort of get under, the, pick under the, the surface of myself as an adolescent. Had he reconciled to some degree with your mother? Yes. They, so the earlier time we were talking about when he had this sort of mansion, this crumbling, um, awful house that I thought was incredible. It also had an, an elevator. It also had a church organ. Mm-hmm. Um, 
and he and my mother were kind of getting along and he was coming to take me for skates and he helped her a bit because she was going to go to take some classes at night on Wednesday at a college to graduate from univer- from college and so he was going to help me out he was going to help her out and take me and these were nice times he was really showing up he was really coming by and trying to get to know me and later when I was writing I thought oh that must have taken a lot of courage I don't know about you but when I'm when I find something difficult especially when I'm pretty good at things it's hard to stick with the thing I'm not very good at and he wasn't really necessarily very good at being with me or talking with me or knowing how to relate to me and he kept on trying but I assume you also felt that it was your job to make him maintain his interest to please him certainly and always yeah uh, you, you opened the book with the description of being near him as he was dying, and you were stealing small items. Why, why did you think it? Why do you think you did that? So I don't tell you why I did it in the book. I guess you get to decide. I'm not sure why I did it. I can try to find an answer. I think the clue is in how ravenous I was for these small, fairly valueless objects. What kinds of things are we talking about? We're talking about. Like a tube of lip gloss that is half used and chipping. We're talking about um, pillowcases that were kind of a little bit torn and certainly faded. Um, finger bowls that had a chip. Maybe finger bowls. Maybe a finger bowl that didn't have a chip. But nothing. It wasn't like I was coveting the painting, or the the car, mm-hmm. or the television. <laughs> I don't know if the television was expensive. <laughs> But um, it was such a strong need. I described it like a thirst. I said, and this is true, that I felt like, certainly with a tube of lip gloss and maybe even a few pillowcases, that if I took them, if I sort of squirreled them away in my suitcase and took them back to New York, where I lived in this you know one-bedroom apartment in Greenwich Village with my boyfriend, that I would, my life would suddenly be complete. They felt... This is magical thinking. This is magical thinking. Yeah. I guess there's scenes in Disney movies where suddenly something drab and old, there's some kind of sparkling dust that falls upon it and, it, and it becomes new and bright and colorful. And that was something like what I thought these objects would do. But I guess even right now, talking with you, what I would really say is it wasn't just about making my environment in New York shiny... It was about making it shiny from the perspective also of others. And so I imagine if these things somehow were supposed to give me a feeling that I had legitimacy, which I think is kind of the struggle of the book. Do I, do I have a right to take up space? Do I exist? Should I exist? And it seems almost cliche and foolish that that was my question, right? Oh, someone denies paternity and then I wondered if I had a right to exist. But it was deeper than that. But isn't this also a kind of a pattern in his life as well? Uh, the circumstances of his birth and adoption. And uh, I remember talking to your, what is it, half his ha- sister, Mona uh, his Simpson. His full sister, yeah. His full sister. My aunt. About, about their parents and how he came to not be with that family. And then at one point, didn't his father serve him in a in a restaurant and and think he was a really nice guy because he was a big tipper? Oh, I heard that. I heard that too. Yeah. How strange. Um, My mother kept on saying when I didn't want to write this book because I didn't want to write it because I was too embarrassed to write this book and take up so much attention, the attention I would inevitably get because of who my father is and because memoir is an embarrassing genre because you're saying I, I, I. And she kept on saying, you have to understand your history so you don't repeat it. You have to understand your history so you don't, which I also thought was kind of cheesy because it sounds so grand when it's really so small. In other words, um, I understand that for a nation. A nation has to understand its history so it doesn't repeat it. But does a human really? And isn't that kind of, I'm, you know, whatever, I'll go to a therapist. Um, but it did turn out to be a useful thing, I think. We'll see over time. And maybe patterns in families do repeat in some way. I don't, I'm so careful and I feel so careful about not saying 
what my father was going through because I really don't know. But I do write in the book about how I went to see a therapist in college because I was mixed up and there was sort of free therapy. And I went in, I signed up, I went in. There was this woman who looked like a Modigliani woman. But anyway, she had this narrow face and she was very calm. And finally, after seeing her a few sessions, she said, yes, well, at some point I had a dream about my father drifting away. And she said, well, yes, at some point your father may realize that he had done to you what was done to him. And I thought, well, that's so, mm-hmm. that's so obvious. That's so general. How can you think that my specific and incredibly unique family is following some obvious pattern? How could she know? How could she just say it like that? And then I thought, oh, I guess maybe she's right. <laughs> when did you meet Mona Simpson? I met Mona. My father brought her over one day when I was eight. And there she was, smiling in our living room. Uh, like a gift. <laughs> she was wonderful. And you were very taken by the way she used language. Yeah, I just loved, I loved and I love the way she uses words. And she had a, a wider vocabulary than anyone I knew. And the words felt like jewels. She also had, she had a wider life than any woman I knew. Did uh, you get the idea of becoming a writer from watching her? I don't know. I I didn't. Um, I admired her. I admired her full life. I might have gotten the idea of becoming. I certainly got the idea of becoming a person who went to college. I certainly got the idea of becoming someone who had some independence from her. You had not considered college before speaking to Mona Simpson. I think I was terrified that the tuition would be cut, honestly, or that we wouldn't be able to get there. I was worried that I wouldn't. I actually talked with Mona about this when I was writing this book, but I was worried at some point that if my teeth were crooked, we wouldn't be able to afford braces. And I was terrified that my teeth would be crooked and we would, I wouldn't be able to get braces. And, and Mona said to me, why were you so scared of that? You know, you went to private school. And in fact, at this private school, when I, when I for the second time, could not get in, my father had said, can we give you a donation? He apparently had said, and they said, no, we're not that kind of school. Thanks so much. And Mona said, why were you worried about braces when you ha- when your father was offering to... But I didn't know about the donation, and I felt I felt a sense of scarcity. And, but also, you were under a lot of pressure. There are some tough scenes in the book where your mother seems to blame you for the hardship she's going through. Yeah, I think both of my parents were young. I think they both did that. There were... There are... There are I guess uh, there are several answers to that. At points, she's going through so much hardship, and we were so close that it cannot help but be part of my life. And I think that those, in some ways, are the more alarming scenes, um, or the more alarming scene. One night, it's night. I'm really young, maybe four, and it's pouring rain, and she's screaming. And she said even, when I talked to her about it, that she remembered as she was yelling that I would probably be old enough to remember it later. Um, so that's not a case where she blamed me for it, but that's a case where it, it could not help but to bleed into my life because when you're poor and you're a single child of a single parent, you are, you're, you're tied. But there are also some instances in the book where your father comes off as cheap in a way that's difficult to understand, like when he refused to fix his dishwasher and then you wound up doing the dishes. <laughs> How did you explain that to yourself? I think it might have been something a little bit like the heat where it was a whole thing and he was very busy and the dishwasher that existed in the house as it was was broken and to get a new dishwasher maybe seemed like a lot of work and it was my job to do the dishes so uh, he wasn't going to fix the dishwasher. So Um, you you paid to have it fixed eventually. No, eventually, you know, after feeling incredibly badly for myself, for a while, I finally thought, wait a minute. And I called a repairman, and he came, and it was a $60 charge, and it was a gasket that had decayed, and then it was fixed. And it was this sort of old, ugly dishwasher. <laughs> so as soon as I announced the dishwasher's fixed, they actually got another one. They got a fancy one, I think, a couple days later. Um, so that was effective. <laughs> you described walking down the street with him and seeing a homeless man, and he said, that's me in two years. Now, why would he say something like that? He was worth hundreds of millions of dollars. 
It's so funny. He used to say that all the time. And the funny thing about a book is you can only have one of those or two of those moments. But he used to say, that's me in two years. That's me in three years. Um, a lot. Maybe it was a way to to remember um, his own humility. Maybe it was a way to feel vaulted above these men. I don't know what it was. It was a kind of funny phrase he used to use a lot. Was your mother hurt when you decided to live with him and his family when you were a teenager? I think both me and my mother were in some ways relieved because we'd been having horrible fights, really awful fights, fights that if they'd continued would have gotten in the way of everything. Um, to the point where I'd st- I had run away once, I mean, in a sort of lackadaisical young person fashion, but I had run away once and I think, and then my mother called the police and I think that that had worried my father and probably worried my mother too. So while she was hurt and while it was hurtful, she was also on board with me finding, uh, going away for a while. She needed a break. What were you fighting over? We were fighting. This was a sort of second series of fights that we had in the book. Um, she felt that I was treating her like the maid. And so I imagine it's, I imagine in some ways that's kind of common. I was in middle school and I had gone from being focused on my popularity and on being um, sexy in elementary, in late elementary school and in kissing the boys to a very dramatic shift to wanting to be extremely studious and sort of wearing a uniform every day and studying for four or five hours a night. I had catch-up to do, too, because I hadn't really studied before. And I think she's making dinner, doing the dishes for dinner, doing the shopping, and I think she just got very frustrated and very angry. My guest is Lisa Brennan Jobs. Her memoir, Small Fry, is published by Grove Press. This is London Lopez at Large on WBAI. New York, 99.5 FM. You mentioned you went into therapy. You were move, living with with uh, Steve and his wife, Loreen, uh, and they, they also had a child named Reed. I, I wondered about, I wonder about these names. Uh, he went to Reed College, but didn't he drop out? Was he naming, did he name his kid after the school, or was that just coincidence? Well, I can tell you a secret. I think his favorite name wasn't, his favorite name originally was Herb. but I think everyone had veto power Um, or not me I didn't have veto power but um, he and my my stepmother had veto power so I think he chose it I think he'd known my mother said he'd known someone named Reed with different spelling in high school who was really really cool and really smart and he had been to Reed I asked him if he named it after his college but he said no I think and also let's face it it's just such a beautiful name Mm. Well, but you wound up babysitting for his their child. Uh, you were you wound who was outrageously sweet. You you were in therapy, uh, and you invited uh, Loreen and and uh, and Steve to a session. I did. I tra- I dragged them to a session. I think um, I invited them. I wanted them to come. I felt like if I brought them to the therapist again, this is more about the adolescent. Um, perspective. I think you can see in the book, I'm both an adolescent and an adult writing about an adolescent, but... This is always a problem in writing about something when you're much older. You know things that you didn't know at the time. It's sort of wonderful, though, because you get different layers and different perspectives in the same narrative, which um, which was fun. So, And it was a fun way to have a full character to sort of hold the hand of my teenage self and then be an adult as well. So anyway, I felt as if I, if I brought them to the therapist, then the therapist would tell them what they should do. And then they would say, Oh, Oh, right. Of course. Sorry. We Mm. should, we should try harder or something like that. And said your father decided you should get out of therapy. (laughs) No, no. Um, no, he kindly paid for therapy Mm. for many years. Um, but no, uh, I brought them to the therapist. They seemed kind of nervous. And, um, and, and then, and then my stepmother said, um, and my therapist, you know, who I, I'm still in con- I don't see him anymore, but I'm still in contact with him. And I talked with him about this time. But my, th- my, my stepmother said, when I said, you know, I was crying and I said, I just want you to say goodnight to me. I'm, I'm feeling lonely. You know, 
um, which is odd maybe for a 14 or 15 year old to, but that's it's that's sort of what happened when I moved over there and um, and my stepmother I think very dryly and very in a very explanatory tone said we're just cold people um, people have focused on that a lot that's one of the stories that people have picked up from the book it it appears in most of the press. Um, God, I, I haven't read the press. Oh, I haven't read all of it. I haven't read most of it. It's interesting, the things that they focused on. I'm not going to go into this, you smell like a toilet thing and all the others. Uh, Which I did. I, well, you say that it was bad perfume. So yeah, it was It was sort of rancid um, perfume. But and people, I think people are looking for all the bad things that Steve Jobs yeah. would have done to you or Lorene would have done well, to I you. Well, I felt that with, with Lorene, that line was... Um, a kind of tonic uh, for the narrative, for the sort of mopey, needy teenager. I think what had happened was me and my father hadn't resolved our early childhood um, neglect problem, and so everything was presenting itself as a problem. And also, I had decided, as a lot of teenagers probably do, how the adults should act. And unlike, unfortunately for many adolescents, the world does not adhere to their high standards so or to their decisions about it so anyway so she said that but i thought um at the time i thought oh you're allowed to just say it i mean essentially she was saying you're barking up the wrong tree um and as much as that is a difficult thing to say it's also a kindness i think the reason people also have focused on it is it is the best line it's probably the best line in the book the, but the, the story continues with money being paid, money being withheld. At a certain point, your father stopped paying for your college. Uh, he, I'm not sure he even thought you should go to school. Um, what happened? I think he when, was very proud that I went to Harvard. <laughs> but what I happened think, when you applied for financial aid? So it turns out if you apply for financial aid at a school that is um, need-based, uh, you are ineligible for it until you're 25, at least for Har- Harvard. They said you have to leave until the age of majority, which is 25. They told me, and then you could, um, then you couldn't get, then you would be eligible for financial aid. So you you can't get it. You are not eligible for financial aid if you're if one of your parents has so much money. So at that I was point, kind of a lot devastated. more than 200 million. I guess so. I mean, I wasn't tracking it, but. Um, I imagine I have no idea, but I certainly was not eligible for financial aid at Harvard. So how did you finally pay for your college? So I had been um, living sometimes with neighbors. They lived a few blocks away, and they knew what was going on. They were both lawyers, and they were smart, and they had had a complicated family themselves. And so they had been watching what was going on at my father's house, and they had said many times, hey, if he cuts your tuition, we'll pay it. My aunt had said that years before, so I think it, his pattern of sometimes cu- cutting payment was pretty well known, and I think he was angry with me because I had moved out. and To go to Harvard. Right. No, I didn't mean that, though. I'm, you I were think becoming was, more independent. Yeah. I think that one thing I've noticed, having my own child, and I, I have no authority because he's so new, but he's only five months old, is that this whole process of having a child seems like you're you're negotiating closeness and distance again and again and again. You know, at first he was sleeping in our bed and then he was sleeping beside our bed and now he's sleeping in his own crib and in another room. And, you know, at some point he'll go to school and, and, and then he'll go further and further away and then, and, but he'll still be close and it will be this boomerang until finally he will be released into the world. And I think me and my father didn't have that pattern. Me and my father didn't have that pattern, and so um, perhaps when I left to form my own life, it was worse for us. So, you, and worse for him. You separated, but then you wound up reuniting. And you, how much time did you spend with him as he was dying? I tried to go back. First, I was going back every month, but it was very unsatisfying. And then I was going back, and then at some point he said, "Don't come home," and so I didn't for a year, and then. Uh, there was some overture where he reached out and invited me to something. So I started coming back about every two months um, and maybe for a long weekend or a weekend and trying to spend time with him. 
and finding myself avoiding him and wishing, hoping that we wouldn't have one of those awful moments where he said something really terrible and then maybe he died. And so that was the end for us. But did he ever tell you that he regretted some of the things that he had done over the years? Yeah, at the very end, we had, and I write about, we had this, he asked me to come home, which he hadn't really done before. I'd been coming back, but it had been a little bit unsatisfying. I've been waiting for this Hollywood moment of him apologizing or him talking with me more honestly, but knowing that I wasn't going to get it because who gets a Hollywood moment? Mm -hmm. So I'd been kind of hanging around like some sort of ghost in this house that wasn't mine, waiting for something I knew wasn't going to happen, feeling very sad and lost and needy, and then returning to New York. But my life was so disrupted because I had been going back to California so often. Um, and then I went back a month before he died, and he spent a whole weekend crying and apologizing to me. So that was really meaningful. But it was very late we didn't have a lot of time after that, which makes me sad. Lisa Brennan Jobs' book is called Small Fry. It's published by Grove Press. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. That brings us to the end of today's show, and my great thanks to Lisa Brennan Jobs, to Fran Higgins, who produced this segment, to Charlie Morrow, who composed our theme music, to my assistant producer, Jesse Lent, who was at the audio controls today. What a little and large comes to you on Saturdays at 4 and Tuesdays at noon. You can subscribe to Leonard Lopate at Large Podcasts on iTunes and by clicking on Robin Hood Radio's archive program site, which is robinhoodradio.com. You can also check out Leonard Lopate at Large Facebook page. We hope to see you next week. <laughs> <laughs>